I want to say welcome um, to all the people who are here and also those who are attending the event via Zoom. Um, my name is Kate Jones and I am the chair of the Senate Committee on Teaching. And so before I hand it over to campus provost and executive vice chancellor Lori Kletzer to introduce the event and our speaker, I'd like to make just some brief acknowledgments. So as you know, um, no event like this happens without the work of a lot of people. And the committee is very grateful for Chancellor Cindy Lareve's support for the Senate's varied efforts to recognize and promote outstanding teaching at UCSC, including the Distinguished in Teaching Award that we're here to celebrate today. And I would also like to thank ITS, University Relations, and UCSC Catering for helping to organize this event, and especially for their support in making it possible for us to run it both in person and remotely. And I'd also just like to note that um, we're really pleased that this event can be part of a collaboration with the Teaching and Learning Center, formerly known as CITL, um, for the first ever Teaching Week. And so I encourage you to, to check out their website for all the events that are happening this week. Um, so this is just one of many great opportunities to think about teaching at UCSC happening this week. Um, and finally, I'd like to express my particular gratitude to Rebecca Hurtis and Michelle Chamberlain, part of our extraordinary Senate staff who have done really outstanding work to make this event Event happen, so thank you to both of you. Um, and so we are truly delighted to be able to gather in person and remotely to celebrate the extraordinary teaching that happens every day at UCSC. And I'll just note that this is the first time we've been able to do this in person, so it's really exciting. And um, I'll also add that members of COT have one of the best jobs at the university because every year we get to the read the moving and often really inspirational nominations that come, that put our colleagues forward for teaching awards. Um, and so I'd like to take this opportunity to announce that the Senate has selected the recipient of the 2023 Distinguished in Teaching Awards, and that is Allegra Eroy Rivelez. Great. Y'all are way ahead of me. I was going to invite you to engage in some applause, but, but thank you. Um, um, she's the Associate Teaching Professor in Chemistry and Biochemistry, and um, she will be joining us later, so, so you can wave at her and high-five her um, once she gets here. But please plan to join us next year when she'll be here um, to share her reflections on teaching at UCSC. So this is an ongoing um, presentation. Um, so this afternoon, however, we are here to honor and learn with Professor Nick Mitchell, the recipient of the 2022 Distinguished in Teaching Award. And in the spirit of thinking about the larger world in which UCSC as an institution exists, and we as students and teachers move, we'd like to offer land acknowledgement before we proceed. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa-speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band, comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast, is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. So with that, I want to thank you all for being here, and I'd like to welcome Campus Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor Kletzer um, to the stage to introduce our speaker. Thanks very much, Lori. Thank you, Kate. And thank you particularly, Kate, for acknowledging that these wonderful celebratory moments that we have with each other happen because several, if not many of us, come together to do the work to make them happen. So my gratitude as well to everyone who made this afternoon happen. And I could be happier to be here. So consider this, please, good afternoon and welcome to the second UC Santa Cruz Distinguished in Teaching Award, and as Kate, you said, everything okay out there? The first in-person celebration. So it's wonderful to be able to celebrate being in person. Established by the Academic Senate's Committee on Teaching in 2019, the award was created to be a counterpart to, and I think it's an important counterpart to, the Excellence in Teaching and Award. That award, is really motivated by students. Students initiate that one by nomination. This one, the Distinguished in Teaching Award, gives faculty an opportunity to nominate colleagues and to recognize curricular and pedagogical innovations and contributions that often go beyond a single course and that come from those of us who do the work together. And so I think this award is particularly meaningful. It, it, it seeks 
uh, to recognize instructors who've made significant contributions to educational equity within and beyond UC Santa Cruz. And I know that today we are certainly going to get the opportunity from Professor Mitchell to hear about that. Creative, innovative, and socially engaged teaching practices are centered in many of our conversations and approaches here. Through the Distinguished in Teaching Award, the campus carries the values, the commitment, and what is and will become a deeper legacy. It helps us move this work forward. This award celebrates our deep commitment to teaching and learning as we journey together to become what we easily say, but is not easily done, a student-centered research university, and we continue to pursue excellence and equity for all of our students. First and foremost this afternoon, we are here to celebrate and learn from our 21-22 recipient, Nick Mitchell. Professor Mitchell is trained in critical theory, black radical thought, and feminist theory here at UC Santa Cruz. Nick received a PhD in the history of consciousness with an emphasis in feminist studies and served as a founding coordinator of Black Cultural Studies Research Cluster and the Critical Race and Ethnic Studies Graduate Collective. After two years on the faculty into the Department of Ethnic Studies at UCR, UC Riverside, Nick returned to Santa Cruz as a member of our faculty in 2015. Professor Mitchell's research and teaching explore the social arrangements of knowledge and the ways that knowledge and its institutional practices arrange social worlds. Nick is currently working on two books. The first, Discipline and Surplus, Black Studies, Women's Studies, and the Dawn of Neoliberalism, places the institutional projects of Black Studies and Women's Studies not at the margins, but at the heart of the consolidation of the post-civil rights U.S. university. The second book, The University in Theory, Essays on Institutional Knowledge, grows out of conversations that have developed in recent years in the field of critical university studies. The book poses a question critical for theory, and as an economist, this absolutely resonated with me. So I mean theory, and if you will allow me, theory of all kinds, what if we looked at theory not as a tool that offers explanations to us about what the university is, or in my sense, what everything is, but as a complex form of evidence produced by the university, and I might say by academe itself. Nick considers these projects as a two-front approach to a single, if complex, and multifaceted problem. That is, how can we make use of the tools of minoritized fields of study to ask a question that contemporary humanities scholarship rarely does? What is a university? I am deeply, deeply honored and so delighted to introduce Nick Mitchell and his talk, Reflections on Teaching as Labor, Challenge as Joy. Thank you. Amazing, okay. Height differences are awesome. Um, so I had no idea what I was going to do today, and so I, I, I figured I'd structure this like a standard lecture, which really kind of means like I, I plan for an hour before and fail to complete it, and I'm just kind of praying for the best. But um, one of the reasons that I'm really uh, proud to accept this award is um, because teaching has really shaped my life, and I kind of see this as the culmination of a lot of work that um, I've been doing ever since I was a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz. I started as a graduate student in uh, 2005. So like, I had a little donut hole in my career in Santa Cruz, but I've been here for 18-ish years, um, almost half of my life. Um, so uh, it, it, it means something special to be um, recognized by an institution where I've grown um, so much. Um, I want to also thank the Committee on, on Teaching. I want to thank Kate and Rebecca and Michelle for um, organizing this. Um, I want to thank my colleagues um, in the Department of Critical Race and Ethnic Studies and the Department of Feminist Studies who really supported my growth as a teacher. Um, I want to thank my students. 
um, because the, stu the students here have been some of the most engaged and critical, and they constantly push me in different directions to um, really think about what it means to be a teacher and how to do it better. Um, I also, in particular, want to thank the many graduate teaching assistants who I've worked with over the years, because uh, I've come to teach some of the biggest classes on campus. Those classes don't happen <laughs> uh, without graduate workers to, to uh, handle really the burden, the load of, of teaching um, those large classes. So uh, I want to thank them in, in particular. Okay, so I know that because I'm the recipient of the Distinguished Teaching Award, you're probably dying to know what distinguishes my teaching. Um, and so I'm just gonna let the students speak for that um, <laughs> distinction. But uh, most research really tells us that student evaluations are pretty unreliable as a uh, way of measuring the quality of teaching. So I, I polled a, a couple of my former students and. They mentioned, when I asked them what distinguished my teaching, the, the face that I make, apparently. Um, the, they said the, 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 the judgy face um, that I've been blessed with. So um, let me give a shout out to the students who, um, who have been on the receiving end of the judgy face. I don't intend, it. it's just, it's just the, the contemplative <sighs> position. Um, okay, but... Let's start with the story. So my talk today is about teaching as labor, as challenge, as joy, and I wanna begin with a very particular challenge that I faced as a teacher a few years ago. Um, and to use that as a lever to open up a way of thinking through teaching as labor and as joy, I'll end with the joy. Um, because judgy face notwithstanding, I do like joy. Um, my friends are like, yeah, you like the joy of judging, um, whatever. So. In, in February uh, 2020, uh, the graduate workers in the Department of Feminist Studies presented a challenge to faculty. Um, they asked us to go on strike with them. And this was something that I had to think about. Um, they asked us to engage in a full labor stoppage with them. Um, it's something I had to think about because it place pressure on really for me what it means to be a teacher. Um, does it mean to te be a teacher that you teach at all costs? Um, does it mean to be a teacher that you attend to the material conditions that make teaching possible? Um, is, does it mean to be a teacher that you show up in the classroom uh, at all conditions, that you continue the, the labor? Does it mean to fight for the people that you work alongside? These were all questions that I entered into without having a specific answer to. So I, I, I had to spend some time thinking about it. Um, and I think that that really led me into a, a bunch of questions that um, I'm kind of writing a book about right now. Uh, I, I kind of revised my book project to really enter into questions about what a university is, what a, what a student is, what a teacher is, because I realized that we don't have that many historically informed ways of answering that question. Um, so. When the uh, graduate workers in the Feminist Studies Department posed the challenge to us, um, to us faculty, about going on strike, I was teaching my Feminist Studies 20 Feminism and Social Justice class. One of the things that we talk about in that class is the, um, the San Francisco State um, student strike of 1968-69. That's a, a student strike for, that ended up establishing the first college of ethnic studies in the country. Um, and that, see, it's an it's a informative example for me because here's an example where students actually shut the university down in order to build the university up, um, in order to make the university face what it had resisted for many years. And uh, actually fighting for knowledge meant fighting against the, the university. Now, that 
really resonated in that moment because actually the, the question of what it means to be ethically related to the university might have in, entailed actually not teaching. Um, so what am I? Am I a teacher or um, am I a striker? Or does strike, is striking a one way of being a teacher? These were the set of conundrums that I was facing. And so I want to share with you how I thought through some of them because I think one of the ways of thinking about what does this Distinguished Teaching Award mean is to actually go into the question of what it means to be a teacher in the first place. Um, and so students who, folks who have been in my class know that we start with definitions. Um, we start with definitions. And so the question of what it means to be a teacher here is also what it means to be a teacher within a particular historical context um, that define what it means to be a teacher. So what I was being faced with at that moment was what it means to be a teacher amid food insecurity with students who are, who are enduring, enduring food insecurity. Uh, what it means to be a teacher among students who are uh, enduring housing insecurity, and not only are enduring them, but for whom those very conditions define who they are as students. Um, and how can that, those conditions that are defining who they are as students not also define who I am as a teacher? So what does it mean to be a teacher in that context? Now, I'm obsessed with definitions. I think definitions are, gr are really great. Uh, in my Crest 10 class, students know that I rehearse this definition of racism over and over again that's really useful from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, which is that I don't even have to look at the, the page that racism is the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Now, what that definition does is important because it turns racism into most students come into the class thinking racism is prejudice or discrimination against someone based on their skin color. It talks about racism through a whole different lens by turning it into a production. Racism is something that we make like we make, like we make cars, uh, like we make guns. Uh, it is production, but it's also exploitation, meaning it utilizes those things that have also been produced by other forces. So it gets, it's something that's produced and exploited. And it doesn't necessarily re require individual instances of discrimination in order to proceed. Um, and that's one of the things that Gilmore argues makes racism so powerful, so abiding, and operate on scale that it does. So I argue that we need definitions because definitions are lenses. They give us ways of seeing the world. Um, so how do we end up at a defin definition of what it means to be a teacher? And what's at stake in that question? Um, there's a complication here. When we're defining what it means to be a, a teacher and a student, oftentimes we just define one by the other. You're a teacher because, by having students. You teach students. Um, you're a student by being taught by a teacher, right? Um, so there's this reciprocal problem that doesn't really tell us very much about what it means to be a student, where students come from, where teachers come from. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, and if we only define teacher and student based on that relationship, we really lose most of the stuff that brings people into that relationship that is the classroom for a couple hours a week. Like, how much prep do we ask students to do in order to inhabit the classroom for a couple hours a week? How much preparation requires actually producing that person who is able to inhabit the front of the classroom as a teacher for a couple hours a week? So most of the things that turn students into students and turn teachers into teachers are not visible if we're just attending to the classroom. So what are those forces that bring people into them? And also, we think about student and teacher as things that are different from each other. But there are also all, a whole range of social forces that students and teachers have in common. One thing is work. Um, students and teachers both do work. It's weird, we ask students to, students, it's a weird category, right? Um, like we ask students to work, students come to universities to work, students pay 
in order to work. So they pay in order to work unwaged. Um, and this is one of the kind of defining factors of, of, of being a student. So what if we started actually asking the question of what teachers are and what student, students are with an eye toward them having something in common rather than being uh, opposed quantities? What if students and teachers also share the same community? Not necessarily as equals, like student-teacher is always a hierarchical relationship. We don't have to ignore hierarchy, but what if we also acknowledge there being something um, important in common there? Some really important answers to the question of what it means to be a student have come from labor struggle. So the question of work really matters here. Um, there's an instructive example in the uh, several uh, strikes of the past decade from the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, really, the, t the Chicago Teachers Union is um, the harbinger of a, a set of transformations in the US labor movement. Um, and the, the Teachers Union has done a lot to try and reimagine what a labor struggle can look like. Um, the dominant form of trade unionism since the Second World War has really um, framed things in such a way that are relatively narrow. Uh, unions fight for the interests of their workers, of their members, and their families sometimes. That, that it, it extends to that. Uh, the T Chicago Teachers Union represents a kind of progressive unionism that's trying to rethink what it means to be a union. And it's kind of important to do so if you're a teacher. Because one of the immediate, the immediate criticisms of teachers, for instance, if they go on strike, is that, well, they're neglecting their students. Uh, that they are neglecting the youth of the, of, of the future generations. So one of the things that teach, that's defined uh, uh, this, this more recent wave of teacher organizing is organizing with and alongside communities so that the interests of the communities actually get borne out in what the, uh, in what the unions are, are asking for. Um, and so there are a, a few different features that have been popularized um, by the, the Chicago Teachers Union and, and the strikes. Uh, there are a couple, a couple categories that represent this are uh, these ideas of caring across generations and bargaining for the common good. So for instance, rather than just arguing for fighting for increased wages um, or benefits, not that those things don't matter, um, but they've tried to redefine what a union can ask for and align what they're asking for with the interests of the community. So for instance, uh, arguing for better wages, not just for the members of the union, but for people across the board to, to set wages at a, at, at a certain baseline. Um, arguing for affordable housing for unhoused students. Um, and in the process, they've, they've done a lot to rethink what the nature of this kind of fight can look like. Um, what, to, to rethink uh, a teacher's union struggle that actually advocates for the well-being of their students. Um, and so this approach to unionism requires some really difficult work, some really difficult conversations, uh, talking not just to the, the, the members of the union, but to uh, parents, to families, understanding what students are going through, um, what's facing students. And when I was actually reading in 2012 about the, the Chicago Teachers Union strike, I realized I didn't know very well what my students were going through. So I started to practice <laughs> in my classrooms. I've curbed it a little bit now that I teach some very large classes, but like, um, I started the practice of meeting with every one of my students. Um, so I, when I first taught, started teaching the Introduction to Critical Race and Ethnic Studies class, I had 80 students. So like I'd have them sign up and come to, come to office hours. We'd have a 10 minute meeting uh, with everyone and just talk. Um, I thought that it really improved the relations in the classroom and really, in, in, when, we're, when we're doing an introduction to critical race and ethnic studies class, there's a lot of vulnerable stuff happening. Um, there's a kind of endurance that you need to be able to ask of students from all, 
a whole manner of different perspectives. And so what I was asking them was to be in community with me, but what I learned from them was where they're coming from. I also learned that Santa Cruz students in 2015 were a lot different than the, the Santa Cruz students who I'd been teaching uh, when I came here in 2005. Um, the uh, black population had nearly doubled. The Chicano Latino population went from about 17 to about one in four, uh, de dem demographic wise. Students were coming from some of the most underserved, uh, underserved K through 12 districts in the state. Uh, socioeconomically, they were much more likely to be facing food insecurity. They were much more likely to be facing eviction um, and housing um, instability. They were much more likely to be trying to take care of their families um, at, at, at the same time. And so the classroom started feeling a little bit different, but it also came, became a space where students could bring up those concerns and bring them into the, the, the fabric of what, what we were learning in, in the classroom. So I think that th th this form of unionism actually shaped how I approached the teaching part of the classroom and how I approached teaching outside of the classroom um, as well. Um, in Oakland, where I live in 2019, um, a teacher's strike proceeded along similar lines and eventually um, a coalition between the, the, the uh, members of the teachers union and the black organizing project started advocating for the removal of police from the schools. And in, uh, in June 2020, they actually successfully um, abolished the Oakland School Police Department, which was a major thing because at the time, um, the, there were efforts to uh, start closing schools around the city. Um, and the argument was, why are we thinking about closing schools while we have a, an armed force with, within our schools? So actually thinking about getting rid of police was an opportunity and occasion to rethink, what are our priorities? What do we want a school to be? And how can we actually reorganize our resources in order, um, in order to do it? So as a historian, as I was thinking through the challenge that uh, the graduate teaching assistants were uh, presenting to me, I actually wanted to dig, do a little bit of digging and figure out what's the history of Santa Cruz students. I took a little bit of a weird route uh, in, in doing so. I started reading the Santa Cruz Sentinel. Um, the Santa Cruz Sentinel from the late 1950s and the early 1960s. And I was reading the editorial page as the, um, as officials in Santa Cruz were considering bringing a university to the city. Then I started reading classified ads. Um, and one of the things that I, I realized as a refrain, was a refrain in, um, in much of this uh, writing was the idea of bringing a university here was exciting and being presented as exciting to property owners because what it did was it inflated the value of a property. Uh, it meant that property owners were encouraged to see their backyard as now a potential rental space that the value of property might increase and inflate because of the constant demand presented by students. That students would not only make it so that, that, that uh, there, there would be a constant stream of people uh, to pay rent, but also that they'd be churning students out. And so there, there'd be a constant opportunity to increase rent once there was more, more demand. Um, so a literal answer to the question of a student is someone who is taught. But what I was learning from my research was that a materialist answer, an answer that actually attends to what's going on on the ground in the place that you're looking at, is that a student is an economic force that drives speculative real estate markets without benefiting from the markets that she drives. So my, my favorite, he, uh, one of these advertisements here in this slide is uh, the one that says, invest now in land near the new UCSC campus. Don't regret in five years from now that you missed out on tremendous land boom in county property in the Bonnie Dune area of Santa Cruz. 
I, we'll talk about Bonnie Dune. Um, and now is the time to buy before the spring rush pushes land values up. Here are a few of the excellent land values still uh, remaining. And so even before there was a single student on the Santa Cruz campus, there were people investing in the possibility of the Santa Cruz campus because the, students pro the, the presence of students promised accumulation. Um, the students were future renters. Now, when the Santa Cruz campus was being built, the idea that this would be a, a, a majority-minority campus wasn't thinkable. Uh, that this would be a campus that was attended by, uh, by stu uh, more than a third of first-generation students uh, was largely unthinkable. Now, what if those same dynamics actually replicate themselves for a few generations? Well, they started to shape the larger context in which I was thinking. Um, but if a student starts emerging in this shape, what do we make sense of a teacher? Well, one materialist answer to that question is that a teacher is someone who works within those uh, speculative real estate markets that rely on the movements of education workers. I think that this redefinition of what it means to be a teacher actually raises for us what the responsibility of a teacher is. That in teaching, we are operating, we're constantly operating in this context. We're operating in a context that brings students in, that pipelines students in, and that relies on students uh, in order to hold down uh, a part of the economy that actually produces uh, accumulation, that produces rent. Um, and for, now, these are definitions of student and teacher that doesn't, don't have anything to do with the classroom, but that's sort of the point. Most of what we are as students and teachers doesn't have anything to do with what happens in the class. The classroom is only a speck in the, 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 the definition of the forces that bring us to this. What then is a university? Um, the Santa Cruz, uh, the, the Sentinel was reporting that even before the opening of the campus in 1965, in 1964, that already the economic, uh, the, the economic outlook of the town of Santa Cruz was looking up um, based on the new kinds of real estate investment. There were all sorts of new, new permits and uh, new forms of uh, single family um, land projects that were unfolding at that moment. So what's a university then? Well, a university is a social institution in, in which the majority of the work produced is by workers who receive no wages in order to work and who are actually expected to pay in order to work. Um, this doesn't mean that that's all that a university is, but it's one, one version of a university that actually comes, very, com, com, comes into um, focus very clearly when you're looking at it through this kind of perspective. So as a researcher, when I was thinking through this question of thinking through this challenge about what to do when being asked to go on strike, this helped me define and ground my own perspective on the question. I'm actually talking through this because I, I think that oftentimes when I don't know how to answer a question, I do research. Um, and this is a, a habit that I encourage my students to engage in, try and figure it out. As a, I call myself a fake historian, because like, you know, like you, you tell someone you got your PhD in history of consciousness, they're like, you do yoga? Um, yeah, but as a kind of fake historian, I think that this is especially useful for my practice because like the amateurish search through classified ads actually ends up revealing a lot in the process. And I already uh, alerted to, to some of the, the, the demographic change um, at Santa Cruz, but I do want to just underscore some of the things that they mean in practice. Um, the shifts in the di diversity, in, in the uh, racial and ethnic makeup, are socioeconomic shifts. <laughs> and if we, if we don't keep that in perspective, we actually lose some of the things that really matter here. Um, making a campus more diverse means that you're making a campus that, where students are much more likely to be in, experience, in, experiencing food insecurity and much more likely to be experiencing ha housing insecurity. And there's going to also be pressure on those students to be choosing certain kinds of majors because they're trying to escape that kind of food insecurity and housing insecurity at the same time. 
Um, I think that one of the things that we learned, and I, I, I won't go into deep promo for critical race and ethnic studies here, but one of the things that we learned was that um, when we were building the major for students was that students, especially first generation students, were hungry for the stuff they, that we were doing in critical race and ethnic studies, but we kind of had to make it fit into their lives. Um, that we had, to de de we had to define the major, to shape the major, so that students who were majoring in technology and information management, who were majoring in, uh, in computer science or engineering, could take on CREST as a second major because they were there with the idea that they needed to do this major in order to live or escape or improve their socioeconomic lot in life, but they still had desires to learn other stuff um, that felt politically, that felt socially relevant for their lives, and they were hungry for this major even though um, if it were structured differently, it wouldn't be, they wouldn't expect to be able to make it um, fit. Um, and so I want to end where I started with the question of what a teacher is. Ultimately, the way I answered my question, the question or the challenge that had been posed to me was that I decided to go on strike. Um, I decided to go on strike and I did so because I thought that th those qu questions I was asking about well, whether being a teacher means fighting for the material conditions that make teaching possible, that make education possible, that respect the conditions in which the, the students and other workers through, who move through the university are, are um, negotiating, that that is at the heart of my definition of what it means to be a teacher. Um, and that in fighting for de different definitions of what it means to be a teacher on the ground, um, like we see, we see with the Chicago Teachers Union, we actually get new kinds of relationships, new kinds of relationships, um, new social contexts emerge. One of the exciting things about being on a picket line is that it's not just anger, it's not just demand. What you see on a picket line is new kinds of social relationships emerging between people. And in that, in the context of struggle, well, that's where the joy is. And so when we see the new kinds of uh, sociality, um, the, the, the new kinds of connections that emerge in envisioning a different kind of society, that's where we might do well to find some joy. I'll stop there. Thank you. We're doing Q&A, okay. And if you would um, hold your question until I get to you with the microphone so folks who are on Zoom can hear your question before Nick responds, that'd be great. So I wanna start off. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Nick. Um, I was thinking about the really inspiring example that you used about the Chicago Teachers Union, and I was feeling a little envious um, because in high school communities, uh, your student and your family live in the same place. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm wondering if you could reflect on what it would mean for us to uh, reframe yeah. the struggles around uh, both our students' experience and our teachers' experience on mm -hmm. campus in a way that engages this community. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's tricky to, to engage this community because this community was shaped by <laughs> certain kinds of uh, forces um, as well. And I mean, I, I think, the, I feel privileged to have come through Santa Cruz at a different time. Um, even though, like, I'm in six figures of student debt. Like, I, I, I graduated, my, my, I finished my PhD with $100,000 of student debt. Um, so, like, th things were not cheap. <laughs> Life is not cheap here. But um, there, there are, one of the reasons why you see the kind of nostalgia 
from people who've moved from Santa Cruz, through Santa Cruz historically is because of the kind of community that was emergent here that I think feels a lot less possible in the last decade. And that's, part of that's because it's been gentrified out of existence. The, uh, the possibility of graduating from college, living where you graduate, um, and continuing to work, like the huge punk communities, the huge anarchist communities that existed um, in downtown Santa Cruz. Much, much of the, there, there are folks still here, but the pipeline, um, d doesn't exist. So, like, I, I think that just attending to that, that, that those questions just alerts us to the fact that the, the, the place where we are um, has changed a lot. Um, I think... <sighs> now, the question for, for me there is how to make it so that different kinds of life can flourish here um, and aren't getting pushed out so aggressively. I mean, I, I think that rent control is a really great place to start. <laughs> Like rent control would, like it would have been a. I mean, it was struck down um, in, in in Santa Cruz, and I think that um, some folks um, I know were surprised at, at actually not seeing as much support from UC Santa Cruz faculty for for, for, for rent control um, as as they might might have expected. But I think that that the the the, the kind of um, bread and butter stuff, the nuts and bolts stuff about who can live where. Um, and that goes for the people who work here. Um, and I'm not just talking about like fa I'm not just talking about faculty. I'm talking about the people who um, make it so that everyday life can proceed in the university. The people who clean the buildings. Um, the the uh, imagining those people as having an entitlement to be able to live in the communities that um, really shape their their existence and that they contribute to. Um, upholding would be a really good place to start. Uh, but I, I think a university is a different kind of community. One of the things that makes, I think, U US universities singular um, in, in a certain kind of way is the, the, the extent to which migration is a, a, a regularized part of, of being a student. Um, that works in some really fascinating ways, and it also works in some really problematic ways. <laughs> um, universities are able to operate with the expectation that every few years, the people who are most seasoned among the undergraduate, uh, undergraduate population are being pushed out, whether they succeed or fail. You succeed in the university, you leave the university. You fail in the university, you leave the university. But, but, but both cases, and so that's part of the political economy of the, of the institution in which we're operating in. Um, and I think it means that people relate to universities as places you move to, you're open to new, new ideas and, and ways of being in a special way, but also that that's a period in your life that's over before you move into the drudgery of everyday work. And so a lot of pressure gets put onto that. But I, I, I think about like what would it mean to look, think about structuring universities differently um, so that they more, are more embedded in the communities that they, they, um, they rely upon. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for a wonderful talk, Nick, which obviously is not a surprise. But I wonder if you have any suggestions for how we can also support our students who are facing mental health challenges, which were always there, but which were you know, exacerbated by all the factors you described and made worse by the pandemic. So if you have any ideas. Plus, I would also say yeah. that as chair of the uh, Department of History of the Unconscious. We would love to claim you as a historian. Um, th th thank you, Alice. I, I, didn't, I didn't even think about that, 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 that implication. Wow. Um, OK. So I, I have a little, bit, a little bit of an ideological answer. Um, that has to do with mental health services on campus. Um, I, I think that it is difficult for students to 
be honest with mental health providers when they know and when their peers have the experience of the fact that many mental health providers are obligated to call the police um, if they suspect that a student is going to engage in, in self-harm or for a whole range of reasons. So the, 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 struct, the way that our mental health, and th this is something, this is, it sounds like an ideological thing, but because I've talked to students who have actually dealt with this, it's, it's, it's very real. Um, the, the fact that we have built in police as, a, as a, a, a social response to a whole range of problems that students engage, I think that actually severing that link would be a major step and also just, I mean, it would, would increase trust between students and, and, and mental health providers um, as well because they feel more able to be honest about what, 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 what they're um, going through. I mean, there, there are funding issues that also um, really apply here. Um, I am not an expert in the field, so I, all I know is what, what I know from talking to students, so I think those, those are a couple of places to start as well. Hi, thank Hi. you so much for your talk. That was wonderful, appreciate you so much. Um, I wrote my question down because I don't like to talk on the microphone. So I was just thinking about some of Lori Kletzer's introductory remarks, who I think had to leave immediately after the introduction. No, Lori's here. <laughs> oh, okay, great, couldn't see you. Um, and wondering about, yeah, about excellence in teaching and what that means and what that might mean in relationship both with the casualization of labor in the university and the implications of the definitions that you offer of teaching and of the university. Um, and yeah, how that might problematize and call into question the ways that we think about excellence and teaching and um, yeah, what else did I write down? Could you speak a little bit to the tensions in the university's definition of excellence diversity and the self-narration of the university as being about knowledge and like, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I teach this class where I, I actually encourage students to think about if you, if you stop imagining that the university is in the, the first instance about the production of knowledge, like what's going on here? Um, like you actually can see a lot more of the engine that makes the thing run if you if you don't accept its story about itself. Um, I also think that like um, this is a uh, in a, a policy point that will never be taken up. I think that every every person who is going through graduate training in a field. Your pro seminar, your graduate pro seminar, should have to deal with the body count of your given discipline. So, like, w w what ways in which the knowledge that your discipline has has created has been able to create structural inequality, justify or create death <laughs> among among people? Um, and I think that would actually be a much more dynamic and interesting way of introducing people to knowledge that we think is, is, is relatively um, useful. Um, but with the question, the, que the question about excellence um, is tricky because we, excellence is one of the ways that we advertise ourselves to a larger public, explain that, um, what, what our institution strives for. Um, and it's hard to uh, gain to to, to 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 gain the um, the full support of the public if you know, for instance, you're defining the university like I do, like as you know, a, a place that produces students who are um, precariously positioned within a larger e e economic context. It's not a not, not a sexy definition. Excellence sounds a lot better, um, and so I think it's. Acknowledging from the first step is 
it's hard to be honest about yourself. It's, it's really difficult to be honest about the work that we do when we are here. It is very, very, very difficult. Um, it's difficult because it's hard to get up in the morning <laughs> um, w w when you kind of have some of the structural functions of the, 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 the university at, um, in your face. And I think that that's also why we build movements. <laughs> uh, we build movements because th when the, the despair that is, that can come from dealing with some of these problems head on um, can f make you feel alone. Um, so you start building with other people um, and you start trying to build th those worlds that where your workplace doesn't have that function alongside other people, and that, you know, it's not going to get rid of the despair, but I, I think it makes other ways of being live alongside the, the um, entirely reasonable um, sadness. Um, because I think that many of us come here full of hope. Um, many of us come here because we want to see things look different. Um, and that kind of gets into the, the casualization part of your question. Um, I, I, I often see myself as one of the lucky ones. So I, I, I finished my PhD in 2011. Um, like amid the recession, um, there weren't jobs. Um, and so, the, the idea of a meritocracy is dead to me. Like I saw some of the, the, the most brilliant people just get pushed out of the academy because there were no jobs. Um, and I, I saw so much of the collective energy that had been, that had felt part of the world in the beginning of grad school when I started in two, two, 2005, just completely sapped. Um, and part of the way that that's being sapped is that this is something that Mark Bousquet argues in his book, How the University Works. Um, you get your PhD, that's the logical end of a career, um, effectively, because there's no going up from there, because most of, uh, three quarters of the jobs being produced in the academic world are non-tenure track, often pay poverty level wages, often require you to work at multiple di di different um, institutions in large classes in which you're treated effectively as a grading machine. You may not know if you're going to be teaching from one term to the next, et cetera, et cetera. That's the, that is the majority of the work that, the, that universities produce today. And so uh, it's it's, it can be very, very difficult not to, not, not, not to feel pretty defeated when the, you're in a PhD program, um, you're being asked to do some really exciting work, and there's not much on the other side um, for you. I think facing those issues head on, and I, I just got done with a, a three-year um, term as Feminist Studies grad director, my, um, my first month of being grad director was uh, March 2020. Um, so I, I, I got like, I got the strike and I got, I got the pandemic, like I, I, I got the whole package um, all, all, all at once. Um, but yeah, like seeing that there's some re real demoralization is hard. Knowing that that demoralization is entirely rational is harder. <laughs> Um, and that, yeah, the, it, it, it's, it's difficult to deal with. It's hard to give people advice <laughs> um, in, in, in that context as well. Okay. Yeah. One more question, and then we can let you take a break after. Oh, thanks. You know, Nick, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the practice that you um, developed of meeting with all of your students. And I just want to say that having um, been at the helm of CREZ for a number of years and at the inception as well, I saw Nick grow CREZ 10 from, you said it was initially around like 70, 80 yeah. students. Mm -hmm. It's now 250 students. Yeah. 
And um, I also would see a line out next door, and it was week six, week seven, because in this incredible, extravagant pedagogy, I think responding to that materialist definition of a student, you continued that practice of meeting with them one-on-one. -on -one. And can you speak about that intervention? Mm -hmm. And um, can you speak about the social transformation of that intervention. It's entirely unreasonable. Yeah. Uh, like entirely, like, but I'm attracted to doing entirely, I, I like big feats, you know? Like, and so the, the ability to kind of say that I did it, like I was doing, like I was doing classes where I was meeting with every one of 300 students. Um, I, like I only stopped doing this with, with the pandemic because it, it, it just got, um, Un unwieldy, um, but I mean, like in, in some ways, it's a little bit of a pedagogical trick because it's a flex. Like you know, I, I, I can say that, like, listen, you, are you gonna you're gonna you're gonna complain about the syllabus? Like, I met with every single one of you, <laughs> um, but it also like I think it, one of the things that it did demonstrate to the students is that I wanted to know them. Um, and that if you meet with them once, students who came to office hours who had net, like they were seniors who'd never gone to office hours before. Um, they're more likely to come back then. I've had students come and tell me that they started going to other professors' office hours because like they, they came to office hours and didn't, didn't get their head ripped off. Um, and so I think that just kind of being able to shape that experience made, made folks feel a little bit more um, grounded. Um, and yeah, I, I, I kind of developed it as a social experiment. I developed it, the, the approach, when I was um, teaching at UC Riverside. Um, and UC Riverside, UC Riverside um, I would say three out of four of my students were commuters. Um, my, the median age of my students is probably 28 or 29. Um, so they came to campus and then they left campus immediately. Um, they, their, their lives did not center um, around the campus, and so it was really difficult to get to know them. And I think what they responded to was the idea that someone might want to um, in, in, in the first place. So I think, I think that just the, the, the exercise was um, kind of just giving the, the, the like a, a little way of experiencing the idea that you matter to me, <laughs> um, and like I see you in, in, in the classroom, and that, that's like I, I want you to be here. I'm glad that you're here. I know something about you, I know something about your life. Um, I am a human. We're, we're relating to each other at, the, at this different scale that really ended up mattering. Um, I, I, I believe in the big class. I, you know, like he's a little narcissistic. Um, like, it's a, it's a, like it's a little churchy. <laughs> the, 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 the big class, um, but I, like I think that I remember being an undergrad, and I remember going to a professor's office hours thinking I was so stupid because I had taken like it taken me 15 hours to read half of Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Um, and the professor just said, no, that's, that's, a, that's, that's an appropriate amount of time to, to spend on, on that. And oddly enough, just hearing that made me realize, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, like, it it did, did a lot to undercut the imposter syndrome. So I, like, I think I, I took with me the lesson that um, different scale for encountering your students really, really, really can make a difference. And if you force them to do that, and the, the office hours assignment was an assignment, they get credit for it. Um, so if you for, for, force them to do it, then um, I think it can pay some dividends um, further down the road. All right, 
right, well, thank you so much. Yeah. I know that's a great place to mm -hmm. end it. Um, so thank you all for being here. And those of you who are here in person, I'll just don't dash out the door. There's, there's um, drinks and nibbles. And so I hope you'll celebrate and chat with Nick as well. So thank you so much for being here. We'll